Jesus was born in a manger, and Silicon Valley was born in a garage. With the venture capital industry as its father and Stanford University as its mother, this region, once home to plum orchards and cattle ranches, became the fertile ground for the world's greatest technological innovations. Throughout the 20th century, the legend of Silicon Valley grew, attracting apostles and engineers from all across the land to join in the great salvation that would be brought on by computers and the internet. That is, until tragically, in 2001, irrational exuberance condemned the Silicon Valley bubble to pop. For three years, the valley lay dormant. Trillions were lost, or so it seemed. Until in 2004, Silicon Valley miraculously rose again <laughs> with the IPO of Google Incorporated. <laughs> Thus is the origin story for Silicon Valley, the modern messiah of the world's most powerful religion, capitalism. Every culture has its own mythology, the fundamentally normative stories that preserve and perpetuate the values that define the culture itself. And Silicon Valley is no different. We have our godlike founders, our visionary prophets, our epic disruptors. Hewlett and Packard building their first audio oscillator in a Palo Alto garage. Bill Gates selling DOS to IBM but retaining the licensing rights. Mark Zuckerberg bringing his band of misfits to the valley and hacking together the Facebook. But these myths have consequences. The myths of Silicon Valley, and more specifically, the archetypes who inhabit these myths, form a sort of magnetic field that tugs on the tech industry's moral compass, shaping where we work, what we build, and how we lead. So I want to critically examine the nature and the influence of three of these powerful Silicon Valley archetypes, the founder, the oracle, and the disruptor. Our first Silicon Valley archetype is the hero himself, the technological ubermensch, the superman, the founder. Who is this mythical founder? Well, they start their career as a college dropout. Famed venture capitalist Peter Thiel was giving high school students $100,000 grants to start companies instead of wasting their time in college. The founder is ruthlessly efficient. They don't have time to eat meals, so they drink Soylent. They can't waste precious mental cycles trying to figure out what to wear every day, so they wear the same t-shirt and hoodie and jeans. And the founder must be ruthlessly efficient because they're frequently the CEO of two or three or four different companies, the soul and lifeblood of their respective organizations, utterly irreplaceable. But I ask you to consider, what kind of future does the Silicon Valley founder create? For the founder, there's no room for empathy, only efficiency. There are no people problems, only engineering problems. Everything has an optimal, measurable solution. And so our technology companies end up building products that optimize for engagement, with notifications and pings vying for every second of our waking attention, colors tuned to make us click, positive feedback loops of likes triggering our dopamine response, like slot machines and cigarettes, to have us tap again and again and again. And so we end up with social networks that leave us not connected, but depressed. With news that leaves us not informed, but angry. With mobile games that leave us not entertained, but addicted. There are only two types of pushers of product that call their, their customers users. Techies and drug dealers. <laughs> Our second Silicon Valley archetype is the oracle. The oracle is the future seer, the thought leader, the visionary who can predict the technological forces that will shape our future world. Perhaps the most recent famous Silicon Valley prophecy comes from the Gospel of Mark, Andreessen. <laughs> in the Wall Street Journal in 2011, the Netscape founder and venture capitalist wrote that software is eating the world. And it's not just individuals who serve as the Silicon Valley Oracle. The Valley as a whole perpetuates this sort of predictive zeitgeist for what will obviously be the next big thing. Machine learning, self-driving cars, cryptocurrency, drones, chatbots. 
And so the rest of the world looks to the Silicon Valley meta oracle to see where to invest or where to brace for impact. But again, what kind of future does the Silicon Valley oracle create? So much of Silicon Valley prediction is predicated on this notion of technological inevitability. That the inexorable march of progress is an unstoppable force of the universe. And your only options as an individual are to either invest or get out of the way. Automation is gonna take your job, so you better learn to code. Your digital footprint is everywhere, so you better reconceive of your notion of privacy. Electric scooters are the next big advance in mobility, so you better hop on or get left behind. But the Silicon Valley Oracle believes in these things coming true, and they very much well may come true. But it is the attitude of the Oracle of inevitability that removes human agency and thus human responsibility from the future that we create. It is not a human hand, so this logic goes, but the invisible hand on the wheel that steers the ship of progress. Who will be the winners in this supposedly inevitable future? And who will be left behind? Our third and final Silicon Valley archetype is the disruptor. Silicon Valley is obsessed with disruption, of innovative new technologies coming in and turning existing industries upside down. The preeminent global startup conference is called TechCrunch Disrupt. There are firms dedicated to disruption consulting. At USC today, you can get a degree in disruptive innovation. <laughs> Perhaps the god king of recent Silicon Valley disruption is Uber. The taxi industry in its antediluvian period is rife with inefficiency. In comes Uber, you can summon a car at the touch of a button. The status quo is upended and the disruptor reigns supreme. But what kind of future does the Silicon Valley disruptor create? The disruptor in these myths is the deliverer of a sort of Darwinian justice. That the old order, content in its dominance and stagnation, deserves to be taken down. And so the disruptor in these myths doesn't, and indeed mustn't, think too hard about the collateral damage of their disruption. Yet what Silicon Valley companies are disrupting today is no longer just old hard drives. It's people, it's labor markets, it's education, it's healthcare. And today's Silicon Valley disruptor is looking less and less like the creator of a fundamentally new technology and more and more like an adept user of venture capital dollars to undercut prices and dodge regulation and avoid labor laws and exploit public spaces and underpay workers and strong arm suppliers and achieve monopoly. What Silicon Valley so mythologizes as disruptive innovation is robber baron capitalism reborn in the mobile era. These three archetypes, the founder, the oracle, and the disruptor, form the foundations of today's Silicon Valley institutions and culture and values. But these myths are trapped in a different era. They're trapped in an era of silicon. They're trapped in an era of wafers and chips, of servers and cell phones. Our world has changed. The problems that Silicon Valley tackles today are of a much more human form of relationships, of community, of biology, of the nature of truth itself. Our old myths are not fit for this new era. So who is it that we want to be doing the creating? That we want to deliver us into a future built for everyone and not just a select few? I want the humanist who focuses not on achieving growth but on achieving sustainability. Who doesn't just optimize for engagement but optimizes for empathy. For whom diversity and inclusion don't just make their company stronger, but make society stronger. I want the artist, who doesn't just see technology as instrumental and commercial, but as inspirational and creative. Who doesn't just look for solutions that are optimal, but that are beautiful. For whom progress means not achieving greater returns, but achieving greater global understanding. And I want the synthesizer, who doesn't just look to technology as the solution to every problem, but to community, or to government, or to education. For whom technology is not an end in and of itself, but just one of many different means for fulfilling our humanity's greatest potential. Silicon Valley will always represent a great force for change. 
But I believe that all of us in the Valley are fundamentally responsible for the shape that that change takes. But Silicon Valley needs new myths. We need new heroes. And I believe that those heroes could be all of you. Thank you.